welcome to a new mini-series on the mega trends that will impact us as investors over the next decade or more. I want to start with an area we all take for granted, but let me explain just how far we've come so I can wake you up to smell the coffee. I have just turned 60 years old. Time was, I thought being 60 meant you were close to death, one and a half feet in the grave. Strangely, as I reached that landmark myself, I now of course realise that 60 is the new 40. And I feel more alive and more engaged and more empowered than at any previous time in my life. Growing old is good, I recommend it. Especially when compared with not growing old as seems to have been the lot of many of our best-loved musicians and celebrities this year. But there's one aspect of reaching 60 that I sometimes struggle to come to terms with, and that's the changes I've seen in technology during my lifetime. My first radio had valves in it and walnut inlays on its enormous wooden case. I distinctly remember the first HD television. We went from 425 lines of black and white to 625. The set still took minutes to warm up, so you had to kind of anticipate your favourite programmes and be ready ahead of time. The choice of viewing got harder in 1964 when a third channel, BBC Two, came along. About the same time we got our first radiogram and I began my passion for collecting 45 RPM singles by everyone from the Beatles and the Stones to Del Shannon and the Everly Brothers. As the 60s drew to a close, how I envied my rich friends with their colour TV and my folks would eventually catch up with that in the 70s. Then came personal computers that were so useless at first that they ended up gathering dust in the cupboard, but they suddenly went mainstream with IBM and Apple in the 1980s, followed by those shoebox-sized mobile phones that we road warriors would clutch while driving up the M1 at 90 miles an hour to our next appointment. Then came the real game changer, the internet and the immediacy of email. Smaller phones that combine computer functions with always on internet have become the blessing and the curse of the 21st century. I regard many people as now having an illness of addiction to these pesky devices. But that's a mere irritant compared to the mega trend that this technology is unleashing. I believe not one person in a hundred yet understands the full implications of this smartphone and cloud technology. As investors, we need to be aware of some transformational opportunities that are emerging. Small companies can access a global market instantly and at very low cost. Barriers to entry are crumbling. Whether you accept the stratospheric valuations placed on tech companies like Facebook and Amazon, the fact is that many investors have become wealthy beyond their wildest dreams by riding these tigers. Finding the next unicorn or shooting star is an industry in itself, and I would argue capitalism as we've known it is disappearing. Uber has become the biggest taxi company in the world without owning a single car, Airbnb the largest hotel group without owning any bricks and mortar. The smartphone and cloud revolution is also enabling globalisation. By the end of this decade, two-thirds of the world will be on 3G compared to a quarter at the start of the decade. Moore's law continues unabated as we move from 128 megabit chips to 128 gigabit processors. For half a century now, and that's the bulk of my time on this planet, developments in technology have made us more efficient. I'm way more productive now than I was even a decade ago. Whether I'm in my office in Richmond or sitting on my balcony in Antibes, I can communicate instantly with Elite Investor Club members on five continents. Real-time information on retail sales goes directly to the CFO without needing layers of accounts clerks to analyse it. And sophisticated software allows companies to communicate by email, in webinars or on video, and reach a multinational audience at remarkably low cost. Except there is a cost. Technology is a huge opportunity for investors, but it's going to create massive levels of unemployment. It started in factories with cars made by robots. Now the robots are working as housemaids in hotels. 
How long before taxis are driverless? Let's make some comparisons of employment levels at what I'll call old technology businesses and new technology companies. Low-cost supermarket chain Walmart employs a startling 2.2 million people. Amazon, the everything store, has just 154,000 on its worldwide payroll. Mobile phone company Vodafone has 101,000 staff, compared to the fast-growing WhatsApp with a mere 180 people. Hilton hotels need 155,000 employees to look after their guests, while Airbnb gets by with 2,000. Rupert Murdoch's News Corp has 30,000 people, Facebook just 10,000. In the past, there's been a conventional wisdom that new technology creates new job opportunities. I think we have to accept that today's technology is a destroyer of jobs. There's a new verb I want you to add to your vocabulary, whether you're an employee or a business owner, being Amazoned. Take a careful look at your job, your profession, or your business. How might you be eliminated or commoditized by new technology? And don't for one moment think this is a blue-collar issue alone. It's happening to accountants today. It's happening to middle management today. And of course, it's decimating the high street, especially at Christmas time when many shops do the volume of trade they rely on to get them through the rest of the year. Wise up to technology or be wiped out by it. We all moved up to larger family homes and cars as our careers blossomed in the 90s, while the smart ones started putting money into pensions and PEPs, the first form of what we now call ISAs.